This is Books of Titans, the podcast dedicated to the influences of influencers. The books that have helped shape prominent inventors, business leaders, athletes, intellectuals, scientists, and others. We'll talk about what makes these books such classics, and at least attempt to have an intelligent discussion about what makes them so important and influential. Today we're going to cover the book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, The Fates of of human societies, also called Guns, Germs, and Steel, a short history of everybody for the last 13,000 years. This is a book by Jared <laughs> Diamond, and uh, Eric is the one who read this. I did not read this, so we're going to be doing one of those uh, more one-sided deals. We've got uh, some other stuff on tap coming up real quick, but this one... I got to say, my co-host here has been gushing about this book, so I'm looking forward to giving him an outlet f- through which to gush. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll actually be doing this podcast a little bit differently in, ter- in terms of uh, structure than we often do. Uh, Eric, you wanted to actually start with a story and, and jump right into uh, one, of the, one of the key points of this book, so let's go ahead and do it. What... Uh, Tell us about the Battle of Cajamarca and uh, what this all has to say about uh, all of our history for the last 13,000 years. Yeah. Uh, so te- uh, just a, a brief history on my side of this is 10 years ago, I worked in Peru for four months. And before I went, I read a book called The Last Days of the Incas by Kim McQuarrie McCoy- and that that book highlights the Battle of Cajamarca. And I remember reading that and I, I still I still think about that book in that story all the time. And I'm I'm just gonna read a, a chapter from Guns, Germs, and Steel about the Battle of Cajamarca and why it uh it made such a uh, impact on me. Oh, and, and before we get any further on that, who actually recommended this book? Why why did you read this one? Yeah, this one was. Um, I'm gonna pull that up here. And 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 actually, come to think of it, did you know that this was going to focus on the Battle of Cajamarca when you actually put it on the list? Had no idea, but if you look at the front cover of the book, that is the Battle of. Uh, it's the Incan Emperor Atahualpa getting kidnapped. So. Um, I'm sorry good, uh, to everybody that we are going to mangle Incan names on this. I'm sorry. <laughs> we, you know, we can do the best we can with, with, you know, Spanish and English and all that. But, uh, yeah, Incan and Aztec names, uh, not, not so, not so good. So, uh, Stuart Brand and Patrick Arnold both recommended this book. Stuart Brand of all people. Yeah. Go figure. I mean, yeah, right I, t- I tweeted. Right I guy. tweeted about it, and and he uh, he liked it today. So yeah, how about that? Uh, He's a bright guy, no doubt. And he was on episode two eighty one of the Tim Ferriss Show podcast, where he recommended this book, and Patrick Arnold on episode one forty three. If you're interested in in listening to those, but yeah, uh, suggested twice, and here it goes, starting on of the paperback version of the book, page sixty seven into page sixty eight, the Battle of Cajamarca. The most dramatic moment in subsequent European Native American relations was the first encounter between the Incan Emperor Atahualpa and the Spanish conquistador Francisco Pizarro at the Peruvian highland town of Cajamarca on November 16, 1532. Atahualpa was the absolute monarch of the largest and most advanced state in the New World, while Pizarro represented the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V also known as King Charles I of Spain, monarch of the most powerful state in Europe. Now, Pizarro, leading a ragtag group of 168 Spanish soldiers, was in unfamiliar terrain, ignorant of the local inhabitants, completely out of touch with the nearest Spaniards, which were 1,000 miles to the north in Panama, and far beyond the reach of timely reinforcements. Atahualpa, 
was in the middle of his own empire of millions of subjects and immediately surrounded by his army of 80,000 soldiers, <laughs> recently victorious in a war with other Indians. Nevertheless, Pizarro captured Atahualpa within a few minutes after the two leaders first set eyes on each other. Pizarro proceeded to hold his prisoner for eight months while extracting history's largest ransom in return for a promise to free him. After the ransom, enough gold to fill a room 22 feet long by 17 feet wide to a height of over eight feet was delivered. <laughs> Pizarro reneged on his promise and executed Atahualpa. Yeah. That then led to, uh, with the, the Incan ruler dead, that, that made it much easier for the Spaniards to then complete that conquest. 168 soldiers took out 7,000 people in that battle and did not lose a single person. <laughs> they had I shouldn't one, be laughing, but wow. They had one guy get hurt. They what, had one guy get hurt. Did I don't know. 168 people took out 7,000 people and kidnapped the emperor without losing a single person. How in the world does that happen? Well, we're about to find out because this book gets right into it. And yeah, sounds like we're in the in the plot of The Last Samurai here, right? Yeah. I mean, a very and, and that, that is such a vivid example. If you've seen that movie where the samurai are rushing the, the army and the army just unleashes Gatling guns and just mows down the samurai. I mean, you kind of get that feel for, for what's going on here. And so th this book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, answers that question of why and how this could have happened. And it uses the Battle of Cajamarca as a way to explain how guns, germs, and steel influenced history. So the author of the book, Jer Jared Diamond, says he got interested in this uh, while he was doing work in New Guinea. And a friend of his, uh, a local in New Guinea, uh, they were taking a walk on the beach and Yari, his friend, so he calls this Yari's question, asked him the following question. Why is it that you white people developed so much cargo and brought it to New Guinea, but we black people had little cargo of our own? And cargo in this sense is uh, just stuff. stuff. Yeah. And so the, the, the question in a... a expanded form is what, why did human development proceed at such different rates on different continents? And so that is what Jared Diamond attempts to answer in 444 pages. And Jason, as you said, it covers 13,000 years. It actually covers more because he, he talks about 40,000 years past. Uh, so he, he yeah, takes similar quite a, in that respect uh, to some of Harari's stuff, like uh, Sapiens, uh, where he's trying to do a similar thing. But this is much more in terms of, in terms of uh, you know, again, looking at differences in development rather than trying to look at just what makes Sapiens unique. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, a little different. Mm -hmm. So uh, you've got that question. Why did human development proceed at such different rates on different continents? And a common response, and one one that I've heard, is best summarized by the example he gives of Australia. So he, he goes back like 40,000 years in Australia and then says, okay, well, then the British came in, in in 100 years, they did what the Aborigines could not do in the previous 40,000 years. And so is it is it that the British were civilized or were they were they smarter or, you know, what was the reason? And, and mo most of the answers you'd get is, is well, the British were civilized or, or, or some, some thing along that line. And, and he quickly puts that uh, to, to, to the wastebasket, he says, and gives different reasons for why, why this didn't happen. Uh, one, one thing I loved that the author did is he would flip all the questions around. So in that first story, he would say, why, why wasn't Atahualpa kidnapping Pizarro in Spain? Or why wasn't Atahualpa kidnapping Charles I in Spain? So why weren't those two things flipped? Especially you know, why given the numbers. I mean, the, if you think mm -hmm. about it, the, the number of people that Atahualpa actually had in his empire 
mm-hmm. was way more. I mean, he had enough people to go and and take Europe without da- without question. I mean, he had mm-hmm. way more people under his authority than the king of the Holy Roman Empire had, right? Mm-hmm. The, the supposed emperor, but you know the the uh, the ruler of Spain had nowhere near the number of subjects that Atahualpa did. So yeah. Uh, well, in the story, the stories. I mean, if, if you want to dig deeper into that uh, Cajamarca story, um, a, a lot of the, uh, of the 168 Spaniards wrote about it. So they, there's a lot of firsthand accounts and I mean, just ridiculous stuff like uh, the priest or, that was along with the Spaniards went up to Atahualpa, showed him the Bible and was like, you know, you've got you, you must swear allegiance to this. And, and Atahualpa just threw it on the side. And then that was the reason that they could go attack him because he had thrown this Bible. Well, of I mean, course, he can't, yeah, he nice can't, pretext. He can't, yeah. He can't read. I mean, he can't read anything in the Bible, the, the language. And, and so it's just, the whole, I mean, the whole thing is just absurd. And then the, the thought I had when I read about that battle 10 years ago is it has to have something to do with, you know, you hear the stone age, iron age, uh, bronze age, and, and how different strengths of metals, play play a role and that that was a huge part of the battle of Cajamarca because the weapons that the the Incans had just wouldn't even pierce the armor of the Spaniards and then if you've got a stronger metal sword against a weaker metal sword you know it would, it would just break their sword and so that that's some of the reasons uh, it's other hard ones to imagine would, how disheartening that would be like you go into battle and you you're used to actually you know you're you're this imperial force and you're used to ha- to winning in battle and all of a sudden you go out and like your first stroke your sword shatters yeah and you're like and you see everybody around you like or the the couple guys in front of you right mm-hmm. their short their swords don't cut into the armor and then you make contact with their sword and it shatters and you see all of them die and you just go this is not good well and and so this gets into to, into the book then they had horses the Incans had never, had never, most of them had never seen horses. So you've got these, you've got these new animals, you've got stronger, stronger, uh, metals, uh, armor and, and, and yeah, it just, it just took them, it just took them by storm. Um, so, so you, this, this story is the, is the, the way he works it in and, so wh- why was why was it the Europeans that were going over there and doing that? One of the r- main reasons that that uh, Jared Diamond says is because of farming, and and uh, the germs that that went along with the farming. So the Spaniards came in with horses, but they also five years previous uh, germs from Europe had already hit the Incans and had taken out two of their, their, their emperors. So I guess another, another way of, uh, you know, you mentioned just the, the demoralization of all that. Imagine these Spaniards coming in and you start seeing a lot of Incans die, but none of the Spaniards die from this, from, from this Disease. Yeah, and from their from their perspective, that that's probably some sort of divine judgment or whatever else. I mean, that's how many of them interpreted it. Yeah, and these are like some sort of divine beings because they're not dying, but we are, and our, our leaders are dying. Well, and it's so hard, it's hard to really even fathom the percentage of people that died in some of these yeah. areas when the Spaniards showed up. I mean, you yeah. think about the 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 impact of smallpox and then influenza in uh aztec mexico yeah back in you know when the when the spanish invaded and if i if i remember my numbers right and and we can check this and put it in the show notes if we if if we uh have the wherewithal but if i have my numbers right i think it was something in within like 60 years or something the population was cut by 90% yeah yeah there were some parts in um like the mississippi area Mississippi River area that were ninety five percent. Yeah, you're looking at ninety percent of the imha- inhabitants just drop dead. Yeah, and you got to be looking around if you're one of the survivors. You're like this, like this is unnatural. Yeah, <laughs> right. But it's actually perfectly natural. It ha- it has to do with again, like you said, he brings it to uh, farming and not just farming, but but actually which cattle 
you used for your farming and whether you had horses and closeness to, to animals that actually allowed some of those things to, you know, the, that, that resistance had developed in among Europeans and it, and it hadn't with the, uh, you know, with the Americans, correct? Yeah. And, and, and so the question is, well, why did, why didn't the Europeans die from, from these diseases? And, and as you said, they, they had developed the, uh, immunity against them, but they, they had died as well. It was just, you know, the, the people that lived, they're passing along their genes to, to their children. And then, you know, over, over time they're immune, but they go to these new areas and, and they're not immune. Uh, but, it, but that, that all comes from farming in a, in a, a sedentary lifestyle where, where these germs are, are, are put into the society, but, um, but, but the immunity is, is gathered over time, but, but not in the other places. So uh, he contrasts obviously the hunter gatherer versus farming and, and societies that went more the farming route had major advantages over hunter gatherers. But at and the same time, what about, what about with the Incans and the, in the Aztecs, they were farming societies, mm -hmm. right? And they, so then, then you get the to, there? then you get to environment in what, what they had available. Uh, so that's one part of it, just what, what was available in terms of crops and animals. So the Incans did not have work, working animals, like workhorses type, yeah, type there animals. You go. They had llamas. <laughs> and llamas, llamas, llamas can't, awesome. yeah, but they can't pull, you know, they can't, uh, they can't do a lot of the hard work like an ox or, or, or something could do. Uh, so that's, that's one part of it. Um, he talks about the, the way the societies are, or the, the, just the, the continents are, are set up. So at that time, well, I mean, still, still, but in Europe, he, he talks about Europe and Asia connected in, in this book and they're roughly in the same axis of straight across. So if one crop grows well on the Western side of, of Europe, Asia, it's probably going to uh, grow pretty well on the Eastern side as well. Whereas in America, uh, you can't, you can't take a crop from one area and do it in another area because it's vastly different climates. There are also some natu uh, natural barriers in the uh, North America that kept the Incas from, from really meeting other groups of people. Whereas in Europe, you know, there's a lot of different people groups meeting each other. So uh, with farming, you, you also like, well, if you're a hunter gatherer, you can also you can only have like one kid every four years because you're moving around. You got to carry him around. You got to make, get the kid to a point where he or she can walk, walk around on their own before you have the next child. Whereas farming, you can, you, you're able to have more children. You're, you're in the same place and then you want more children because they can help on the farm. Uh, it also creates abundance to where you have, people who are, don't have to be involved in the day-to-day -day gathering of the food. So that opens up people doing other types of jobs, uh, innovation, and, and then also with more people, you're going to have more innovation. So innovation is going to lead to weapons. So the guns part of the, the title of the book, uh, and also metals, and then the farming and the closeness with animals is, is the germs part of the book. The societies that had more of that we're able to easily go in and take over societies that didn't have those things. So it's an un unequal distribution, uh, but a, a lot of it done with the, just that species of animals as well. And, and as we mentioned with, um, with the llamas versus ha having horses in Europe. Uh, but, but once those things are on par, like once, um, you know, a lot of, maybe movies we've seen of, of, uh, of American Indians, they'll, they'll have horses. And, and once they did get horses and once they did get uh, guns, they were more on par with, uh, with, with the Europeans coming in than, than, uh, without those things. So that's some of the, the top level things he discusses. I, I do have some quotes that, that tie in some of the other things I thought were interesting. If, um, 
if we're ready to go into the, the quote yeah, section. Let's do it. Let's do it. But before we get to that, one more. This is a post-production edit. I got a text from Eric while I was getting ready to edit this uh, this episode down where he sent me the following uh, about a, a typical segment that we do, particularly in books that Eric has read, of a favorite word. And he said, uh, I'm going to go ahead and quote this. I forgot to discuss steatopigia in our Guns, Germs, and Seal episode. And then he included a quote. Both the Khoi and Sun look or looked quite unlike African blacks. Their skins are yellowish, their hair is very tightly coiled, and the women tend to accumulate much fat in their buttocks, termed steatopigia. Well, that's a, a favorite, another favorite passage and favorite word that uh, Eric got out of this book. We now resume the podcast in progress. All right. So the first one is the striking difference between the long-term histories of people of the different continents have been due not to innate differences in the people themselves, but to differences in their environments. So, he so comes again, down that's the main firmly on of the book. He comes down firmly on the nurture versus nature side of things and particularly on the benefits of environment as opposed to any sort of innate difference. Yeah. And, and, and so with examples, he would say, so in Australia where you've got Aborigines there for, he says 40,000 years, and then, uh, the British come in for a hundred years and, and introduce, uh, all these advancements. Um, he said, the reason for that is the British took all, all the things from Britain and what they had learned and brought them to, Australia. Um, but there's a lot of stories of, of, of British people in some of these countries without those aspects of civilization, and they have just as much trouble. And the, the flip side of that, uh, one really cool thing in the book is he contrasted Australia versus New Guinea, which uh, uh, apparently way back were connected and, and, and then split. And you have vastly different societies there. And in New Guinea, New Guinea uh, went more of the farming route, whereas Australia was more the the hunter gatherer route. Uh, and then Europeans going to New Guinea, they never really took over like they did in, in other places. And that's because the uh, in New Guinea they had they had malaria, they had uh, they had their own germs that they were giving to the Europeans. So it was neat to kind of see that that flipped in that way as well. Uh, second quote here, the combination of government and religion has thus functioned together with germs, writing and technology as one of the four main sets of proximate agents leading to history's broadest pattern. I, and I put this in there. Uh, I mean, the only criticism I had, had of the book is he only briefly mentions religion's role. Uh, he he at least acknowledges it and states its importance, but then the book was just more geared towards earlier trends that led up to the societies in which these religions started. Um, and in in a 440 page book, you're not going to be able to 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 hit all those things. But um, I, I thought it was just kind of interesting that 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 it just got that brief of a mention. Uh, here's here's a good quote for. Um, <laughs> to stir things up politically. Immigration is merely restoring the diversity that America held for thousands of years. He's not wrong. <laughs> I'm going to read a paragraph. Immigration is also, generally speaking, if you look historically, immigration is also the lifeblood of, of, of a robust economy. If you don't have massive, if you don't have significant natural procreation, then you need immigration to continue to uh, to grow your economy. I mean, those things, uh, that's a pretty natural thing, uh, and it's pretty obvious, but uh, lots of people forget this. Yeah. I'm going to read a, a paragraph here as, as one of the quotes, and I want to highlight this because Jared Diamond said that this is the single most astonishing fact of human geography for the entire world. So these Austronesians with their Austronesian language and modified Austronesian culture were already established on Madagascar 
by the time it was first visited by Europeans in 1500. This strikes me as the most single astonishing fact of human geography for the entire world. It's as if Columbus on reaching Cuba had found it occupied by blue eyed, blonde haired Scandinavians speaking <laughs> a language close to Swedish, even though the nearby North American continent was inhabited by na native Americans speaking Ameri Amerindian languages. How on earth could pre prehistoric people of Borneo, presumably voyaging in boats without maps or compass, end up in Madagascar? So that was kind of that was kind of cool. Last uh, last quote here: The nations rising to new power today are still the ones that were incorporated thousands of years ago into the old centers of dominance based on food food production, or that had been repopulated by peoples from those centers. So why is this book important? Why? Um, because it, it's it's the nations that we see today are, are based on a lot of these things that have been happening in the past. Uh, it, the book really made me think, too, of because he talks so much about the importance of the environment. It also made me just think on the individual individual level as well of, of the importance of the environment on the individual, uh, whether that's education, uh, things like nutrition, anything, just how those things can lead to vastly different outcomes as well in, in, in each person's life. So any, uh, any questions, Jason, you had from? Well, I mean, it's interesting because, um, a, a few things. One is I, I'm, is more of an observation, and this is that I actually, when I teach certain classes on ancient Mediterranean culture and all of that, that I spend some time discussing the reason that you wind up with ancient ancient empires in the specific areas that you do. So, for example, uh, you wind up with a lot of empires that, that the strongest empires tend to come from Mesopotamia, that area between the rivers, uh, mm -hmm. between uh, the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. Uh, and then they tend to butt heads with Egypt, which uh, tends to have a pretty strong imperial structure in various t time periods. Uh, and then from there you have, you know, some other conflict with some other, other, uh, other particular planes and all that. But those, those two are the main centers of power in that Mediterranean region and that, um, you know, Asia minor area. And I asked my students, well, why? And the reason is precisely what he gets at in this is, is environment. When you are in say the hill country of, uh, what is today mod modern day Israel uh, in you know the northern area of Ephraim or something um, that is not conducive or even more so the the wilderness areas of of what was then Judah uh, it's not very conducive to sustaining empire because in order to have empire uh, and I'm sure I'm, I'm curious as to how he deals with this but if you look at you know these ancient empires of Babylon and Sumer and uh, and uh, the Akkadians and uh, and uh, the Assyrians and then and the Egyptians, what distinguishes them is initially, you know, you have mostly nomadic shepherds and all this, and that they develop into societies that uh, that are larger and more connected, specifically because people find areas that are really amenable to agriculture, and they can settle down and begin to plant those fields and and. When you plant that field, first of all, planting, you plant in that type of, unlike rice, which we talked about in, the, in, uh, in, in our discussion of uh, Gladwell's book on this, um, unlike rice, when, when you're planting these kinds of crops, barley and wheat and all that, you plant it and then you wait. There's a lot of downtime. Well, that's downtime to potentially invade your neighbors, to con consolidate power, to do all sorts of stuff that, you know helps helps uh, establish centralized power. The other thing, though, that's different in this is, okay, now you have grain. Well, grain is, uh, is, is unique compared to, say, all sorts of hunter-gatherer things in that it's easily storable and you can, you can take it on the road and it lasts for a long time. 
right? So if we're talking about being able to sustain an army in the field, well, if you're not a breadbasket nation with large amounts of agricultural product to back you up, then your supply train is basically a bunch of animals that you have to butcher. You know, this is the Mongols managed to find a way around that. And we've talked about that on this podcast before. But, you know, in the event that you're not the Mongols, uh, you invade with that. And the easiest way to get you out of that territory is to attack your, your supply train, <laughs> your supply chain, attack mm-hmm. the animals that, that feed you. But if you're one of these uh, established nation states, you can you can supply your troops with grain that's going to last for months. Mm-hmm. No problem. Mm-hmm. And you can send more. You can put it on carts and just go. So, and then you, in order to sustain that, you develop bureaucracy and 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 uh, and writing and all of this to keep records, and that allows you to keep track of even more. And it and it feeds itself. And that's why over time, these various places that are fertile plains with access to rivers and access to easy easy uh, uh, sources of water to grow crops, they end up taking over. The power, the, the power struggle and these nomadic shepherds and so on wind up serving them. Now, mm-hmm. interestingly, I mean, there's some who argue that the, the story of Cain and Abel in the Bible actually is already alluding to that struggle, that mm-hmm. Abel is the herdsman who, you know, he's out there, he's close to nature, he's the way that things should be, and Cain is the, uh, <laughs> is the imperial power who... He's the planter. He's the one that does, you know, all the agriculture stuff. And what happens? The agricultural guy kills the uh, the shepherd, kills the guy who works with the animals. Mm-hmm. And this seems to be the way that things tend to go. So, um, so I'm curious as to what he does with all of that. Well, he basically goes, <laughs> he basically follows the same thing of what you just said uh, for, for a lot of the book in, in talking about how all that happened, he, he talks about the fer- fertile crescent area and how that was obviously the the start of a lot of a lot of this. But yeah, he goes into writing and in the part that that played, um, the storage of food, and and then being able to attack uh, the hunter gatherers. So yeah, basically what you just said covers like the middle, the whole middle portion of the <laughs> of the book. Uh, just in in a little more detail and when with with different examples. Yeah, but. And, and so this makes me. I'm definitely going to need to read this book then because uh, it it may give me something to to maybe give to my students in, in some of this. Yeah. in terms of giving them something quick to think about. Well, and 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 I th- I think what what it what it also does is um, we may be more used to that of how it started in Fertile Crescent and then went from there. But he talks a lot about China and how it went from China and then how China. Uh, went into a lot of the islands south of south of mainland China, um, and and so that, that how how all that went about, and then he he goes into more recent time with China versus Europe. So China, uh, before Europe had uh, their sea seafaring power, China was was a huge huge shipbuilder. Uh, they're going all over the place in these these ships, and then, but in in two eleven or two twenty one BC, China consolidated. Europe never consolidated. Yeah, under the under the Qin's, which is where we get actually, uh, the 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 name China. Yeah, and uh, so it, when when they're doing all the the shipbuilding and all that in the fourteen fifteen hundreds. One guy, one emperor comes in and says, we're shutting this down. Whereas in Europe, you've got you've got all these different countries competing and they're wanting they're wanting to uh, have better trade. They're wanting to go to new lands. So you've got all these different powers trying to go to new lands, conquer new lands. And and that leads to innovation, whereas you've got one guy on top in China and that can even be as as more uh, even more recent with with Mao and cultural revolution and, and how one man can really stall things and and take out a number of people in the process. Whereas that it, it can it can happen in other ways in, in Germany or in Europe with you know like Germany and uh, but 
China can really, with one person, can really slow stuff down. And, and so he goes a, a, through that a lot, just in the differences of those those two areas. Uh, so that was really fascinating as well. So why does China ultimately fall behind relative to to Europe? Uh, because you know they were ahead for so long. Mm-hmm. What 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 is his his theory there? He basically says it's it's the centralized command and, and lack of competition. Huh. So Europe, you've got all these countries competing on wanting to be the best, and so that is that is that's the that's the one sol- solution. So again, like you said, with Mao and others. Now the interesting thing is, China does not remain unified through that whole period. So I wonder. I don't know. I, I'm gonna, I'm going to have to read that. That'll be interesting. Yeah. It'll be interesting. And they they have been at the top before, so they could easily be back, you know? Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Now, one of the things in terms of uh, Eurasia versus the rest of the world, uh, that that the, Eurasia ends up with a, with a much higher level of... Um, of technology and all that. Is that just a result of the competition and the trade that is, that's allowed there or is he getting into uh, differences in wildlife or that sort of thing in terms of what, what allows that, uh, that dominance and that, that, that uh, opportunity to develop. Yeah. He said, he says with um, the Eurasian people, he says Eurasian peoples happen to inherit many more species of domestic domesticable, large, wild mammalian herbivores than did peoples of the other continents. So, so basically they had, cows and sheep and goats. And so they had more, more of those. Yeah. And then, and then, yeah, back to that original example of, of a, 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 a cow can do work for you. A, a bull, an ox can do work for you. And they had all those. A llama can't do work for you. A llama can carry a little bit, but you can't, and then, uh, yeah, so you can't you can't have a, a, a llama plow your field. Uh, he talks a lot about Africa, too. And you, you have these huge animals, but they're, no one's been able to, to, to domesticate them. You ain't messing with a hippo, yo. A hippo, uh, elephant. I mean, there's been – he talks about a, t- a few parts of history where elephants were used in war, but, but otherwise they're, they're not – you know they're not they're not sitting in people's backyards. And even when they were used in war, they were remarkably unreliable because <laughs> you know they, they, they were um they, it was the sort of thing they were difficult they were extremely difficult to control as you might as you might expect. And um and so the, from from what I've read there there were cases where elephants sometimes did your own group as much damage as the opposing group and they're real utility as much as anything were uh was intimidation i mean it was bringing a you know the ancient tank onto the battlefield they just the problem is that your tank actually has a mind of its own and it doesn't like getting hurt yeah so well it's cool too he talked about the the animals that were in different areas and, and a lot of the big animals are extinct extinct whereas in africa we still have a lot of those big animals and he, he said that's because the humans and the animals were there together the whole time. Whereas, or for, for most of the time, whereas in a lot of these areas where we're seeing extinction, it's the people came to the area. So you, you've got part of that probably germs killing some of the, the animals, but then uh, these people are coming and, and they're killing the animals. And destruction uh, of habitat. Food. Yeah. And then, but then also if, if the animals are growing with the people, they understand the risk. Whereas if a, a, a new set of people come the animals may not understand that these people are going to kill them. And so they kind of, it's like going to a petting zoo, you know, the animals come up to you, whereas in the wild, they're going to run from you. Um, I'm less persuaded by that as an explanation, but. Yeah. Um, But yeah, so, so yeah, he gets into different, different uh, things like that. And then again, that the, the, just the way Eurasia is, is set up where, you're roughly in the same temperature, uh, whereas in Africa, you're going north and south. In America, you're going north and south. In Eurasia, you're going east and west. And so there's more 
there's more continuity in what you can plant and what you, you, you know, if you're, if you're season, if you're in, up. yeah, if you're in Europe and you're trading with China, you guys can also trade, uh, your, your plants and your seeds. Whereas you can't do that in Africa or the Americas. Yeah. And in Africa, you have that whole problem of the Sahara. Yeah. Yeah. Which, but he, and, he, and he says there's basically a Sahara in, in the Americas too, where there's, like Panama just gets so narrow that it's 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 hard there, and then uh, to the north of of um, I guess in in Mexico, whether there's there's desert and stuff there as well. So um, yeah, both Americas and Africa had had some natural barriers there, whereas Europe uh, Europe was was more connected, uh, or, or Eurasia was more con- connected during that time. Yeah, it make, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and, and in particular, they're connected by a very convenient power base in Mesopotamia that served as a uh, as a nice link between the far the far west and the far east of the of the Eurasian uh, multi continent. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's an, that's a, that's an interesting piece. I hadn't really considered that before in terms of the uh, east and west thing. And of course, now with the with Eurasia, you still have that step. Right, you have uh, the steppe that begins in basically in Ukraine and extends all the way to the Pacific Ocean, uh, such that that northern part of Eurasia is really not hospitable to uh, to a whole lot of uh, of agriculture or anything like that. And you know, it ends up being uh, uh, the place of the barbarians, you know, we've talked about, and again, develops the Huns and the Mongols and various, uh, various, uh, nomadic, uh, herd, herd, herdsmen, uh, uh, nomadic peoples. But, um, but again, because that step is separated from that Southern band of, of all the, the, the static civilizations by a lot of, more difficult topography and, and all of that. That's an interesting thing that that also allows uh, a lot more cross-pollination below, but then you also get the periodic influence of the folks from up above in the steps when they get strong enough. Yeah. Which, you know, that's but, new but, blood effectively. That's the power of this book is what, is what you just did. You, you're, you're taking a look at history kind of by a framework that's presented in this book yeah, where things, things are presented as happening certain ways because of the environment. So you can then take a look at, okay, the Mongols were in this area. Here's what they had. Here's what they didn't have. Did this make them need to trade to, or, or conquer to, to get more resources? What were they lacking? It just, it just really opens up your understanding of, of, of maybe a starting point to history and, and it's not perfect. It's a framework, but it's a framework. I wish I had, a, I had read 20 years ago. Yeah. You know, uh, I, I wish I'd read this book 20 years ago because, because of that, uh, that framework. Yeah, and one of the things that's interesting to me, I've gotten, I guess, more interested in this over the years is looking at the impact of weather hmm. on so much historically and, yeah. and you know, in in so many you know flashpoint cases, like you know the the destruction of the Spanish Armada, you know, for example, or uh, the the destruction of the Chinese fleet that went to uh, uh, that that went to uh, to try to conquer Japan under uh, uh, yeah you know uh, under the uh, uh, the Mongol rulers of, of China yeah uh, you know there. There's so there's so many little things where you say, man, if there hadn't been this storm, yeah, this freak storm that happened that wiped out this fleet, what would have happened? Or yeah. you know, if there hadn't been an unusual, uh, an unusually warm or cool period, you know, when the Mongols were just when the Mongols were getting strong, that allowed it them more easily more easily to access those population centers or, you know, maybe dried up some of their food, you know, their normal pasture land or whatever, you know, there's any number of things that you can then start to map on in terms of weather, even that start making you go, huh, 
If the weather had been different in these 10 years in this region of the world, the world would be completely different. Yeah. Or if that storm hadn't happened and the Spanish Armada had managed to de- defeat the English, we wouldn't be speaking English right now, you know? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it's just amazing when you start thinking about some of that stuff. Uh, and putting it in this kind of framework is, I think, really useful. Yeah. So yeah. Any other any other stuff that you want to get into before we uh, before we wrap? No, I'm ready. Uh, ready to wrap. All right. So you've already said that that you wish you had read this book 20 years ago. You sure not 30 years ago? Or are you just trying not to make yourself sound old? I think I was just trying to pull the date that it was published. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, I guess it was what 96, 97. 97? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, that would have been right before college like that. It would have just been a really good time for me to read this book. And I wish, I, I mean, I've seen it in, in the title, it, you know, you, it, it's, it's obvious what it's about. Yeah. But, um, but I, I didn't, I didn't think it would, it would be this awesome. And then, and then just on a personal level for it to tie back to that story of the battle of Cajamarca. And I, I mean, I honestly, I think about that all the time, uh, that, uh, you know, how can 168 people in, 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 in the book I read, it was more about what happened. It wasn't the whys behind it. And here's a book really digging into the whys of, of something that I've been really interested in. And so just on a personal level, I mean, this was just a, a joy to read. And it was one that I was, I was mad at the end of the book because I just wanted it to keep going on, you know? Those are the so best I, books. I actually put this at the top of my list for this year and for the entire Books of Titans project, it's number two after Man's Search for Meaning. Uh, I, I, I liked it that much. I mean, it, it's won a Pulitzer, so it's, it's, it's beloved by many. And Bill Gates is the first guy quoted on the back of the book. And he said, fascinating, lays a foundation for understanding human history. And I think he really nailed it with that, with that quote. Um, and, and like I said before, the, the framework. Uh, if, if I was a benevolent dictator, uh, this, would, this would be required reading for, for high school students. Yeah, but, but you're not be, if you're I was, neither benevolent nor a dictator. So. <laughs> <sighs> we can't have that luxury. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 this is one of those things that we are at some point in this project going to going to put up a list of um of books that we would say, listen, if you are if you have school age children or whatever, you know, th- these are the books that we would recommend for a summer reading list for these ages and these ages and read this not that kind of stuff and it's going to be uh that will be forthcoming and this will be high on that list. So uh yeah, and, and you would say for high schoolers, right? Not not necessarily yeah. before. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I I guess at any point before you start learning about other countries and the history of other countries, so because like this. Grade? I don't know. I, I mean, my my schooling. I did, I did, We didn't get into that stuff probably till late middle school or, or high school. I mean, the the basics maybe, but this. Um, yeah. I, and it's amazing how compelling history can be when you actually do it well. Yeah. And it's just unfortunate that we tend to do such a rotten job with it. But mm-hmm. anyway, that's a soapbox. <laughs> Maybe we should go ahead and wrap. So, yeah, before we before we do wrap, though, just a reminder, we do have a uh, Patreon set up. So if you want to, uh, if you've benefited from this, from this discussion or... Uh, have benefited by getting exposed to some books that you might not otherwise have read. Uh, well, we've we've scratched your itch. Now, uh, go ahead and provide that dollar dollar uh, a buck a show, or you know, ten cents a show. If Dan Carlin's worth a buck a show, maybe we're worth ten cent ten cents a show or something uh, on Patreon, and uh, provide us a back scratcher. Uh, so uh, so we've got that going. You also can. Uh, contact us through all sorts of social media through twitter and instagram and whatever else the kids are using these days well and and uh, as of this week we are now on youtube oh so yeah every single podcast episode is up on youtube and i hear that's that's where uh people listen at work <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah it's also where all the kids are these days so uh next time your kid is done watching all the 
uh, the videos of other kids opening presents, you can go ahead and pop one of these episodes on and uh, listen to uh, a couple buffoons talk about uh, about literature. But uh, until then, I'm Jason Staples. That's Eric Rostad. We are the Books of Titans podcasts. Keep listening, keep reading, and keep improving. And, and read guns, germs, and steel. While keeping it. Yes. I made this.